Thank you very much, Ali. Such a, a gracious uh, introduction. I'm, I'm, I'm deeply moved. Uh, I'm, uh, it, it is a, a, a fantastic thing for a mentor to uh, see that the, the uh, students uh, succeed and actually uh, benefit from uh, the work that they uh, do together with you uh, at the time when they are young and uh, and uh, uh, are able to learn things and then take out to uh, their institutions and communities and uh, so many uh, people benefit from that. Um, I decided to uh, uh, talk about innovations and disruptive new technologies in vascular surgery and endovascular interventions today but before I do that, I just uh, really have to uh, tell you how much I enjoyed the time. I had uh, uh, Dr. Rana with us uh, in, uh, as uh, the uh, best class of the uh, 25 or 30 years that I uh, taught at me, or that was the class of uh, uh, 2013. It was really a privilege to have him and uh, work with him. We actually uh, not only had a, a lot of uh, fun and great time in the operating room, but we uh, actually uh, wrote papers together, as you can see here. I could persuade him to write about venous disease, but his heart was really with the aneurysms and uh, um, uh, much more so with thoracoabdominal uh, aortic pathology, and that's what uh, uh, he uh, liked to write about most. Uh, it was also, as you have you've seen this picture, it was also uh, a privilege for Dr. Cronenvet and myself that uh, these two fellows, the very best, posed and uh, uh, allowed us to have a picture with them, uh, uh, Dr. Manunga and uh, uh, Dr. Rana, and I'm, uh, I'm uh, truly gratified to see that both of them are here today. I was uh, 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 very pleased to uh, graduate Ali and uh, see how uh, happy uh, uh, his wonderful wife Sabine was to uh, finally uh, get out of Minnesota and come a little bit uh, uh, back to south. Before uh, Ali finished, we uh, tried to persuade him uh, to uh, take the Mayo message with him that the needs of the patients come first. Uh, before he uh, decided to come to Albuquerque, and I think that he did a good job. He remembered what he learned at Mayo. He knows that the patients are the most important goal of our life, and, uh, and um, uh, he's having, uh, as I have seen, uh, now the second day of my visit here, such a, a wonderful group and wonderful time uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So. Uh, uh, thank you uh, for uh, the opportunity, Ali, to uh, be here with you guys. And uh, uh, both uh, Monica, my wife, and I uh, appreciate very much the wonderful hospitality that you extend here. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about innovations and disruptive new technologies in vascular surgery and endovascular intervention. We uh, use invention and, in, and uh, innovation a little bit uh, like similar things, but uh, these are actually two different uh, categories. Invention is a new idea or creation of a brand new device or process. It requires scientific uh, skills and a patent uh, protects your intellectual property, but you need much more to make this intervention work. And innovation is the application of an invention. It adds value to your new device or idea. It uh, meets existing or unarticulated needs. And it requires much more than just a scientific skill. It also requires technical and marketing uh, skills. Innovations, most of them are continuous innovations so-called sustaining innovations. But disruptive innovations are game-changing, revolutionary breakthroughs 
This is new advanced technology that quickly outperforms established methods and disrupts completely the old market. Sustaining innovations are, you know, the uh, petrol or diesel cars or landline phones or televisions uh, or a taxi. But the game-changing uh, revolutionary innovations are the electric cars, the cell phone, the smart TV, or in service, you know, the Uber or uh, the Lyft. Bill Gates once said that innovation is the most powerful force to, uh, for change in the world. Fundamental innovations in the last century and actually in the 1800s uh, changed surgical care forever with the development of anesthesia or uh, the introduction of uh, uh, hand washing by Ignaz Semmelweis, the uh, 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 name uh, giver of the, my alma mater in uh, Budapest, or the development of antisepsis by Sir Joseph Lister. Now, uh, these are the top 12 innovations that I think uh, that changed the course of vascular surgery. Development of vascular anastomosis, endarterectomy by Sid Dos Santos, vein bypass, the first vein bypass, use of homograft by uh, uh, Charles Dubost, the introduction of prosthetic grafts, forward to balloon catheters, IVC filters in venous disease, clearly uh, radio frequency and uh, laser ablations completely changed how we deliver vein care. Balloon angioplasty stents and stent grafts transformed arterial surgery to endovascular interventions and obviously branched and fenestrated graft put that to a completely uh, different level. So the endovascular revolution was clearly a disruptive uh, innovation that disrupted the old market of open uh, surgical interventions. And uh, to uh, really uh, make invention and innovations with endografts and uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, reconstructions of the entire aorta, we needed improvement and innovations in endovascular techniques improvement uh, in uh, uh, balloon angioplasty, and now we have plain cutting, scoring, and dog eluting balloons, and improvement in stent graft technology. Uh, we are having now drug eluting stents, bioresorbable stents, and the new integrated biosensor stents are almost here to be uh, tried in clinical practice. Uh, the endovascular revolution, as you've seen this morning, really affected uh, fundamentally the way we treat uh, not only aortic aneurysms, but traumas, uh, dissections, uh, and aortic pathology like ulcers or intramural hematoma. The uh, contribution of certain people was instrumental. Uh, and uh, one of the very first one, although just later recognized, was Nikolai Volodos from uh, Ukraine, Kharkov. His grave probably is completely uh, destroyed and the hospital where he worked is uh, probably in ruins right now uh, because of the invasion in Ukraine. Uh, but, uh, you know, his contribution was clear. He patented stand grafts and uh, he uh, performed the first uh, uh, thoracic uh, endovascular repair with a stand graft as early as in 1987. Uh, as we talked about, Juan Parodi's contribution was really uh, the most uh, effective uh, um, introduction of the endovascular techniques and uh, uh, he uh, performed these operations in Argentina and pretty much uh, these uh, operations were done in the United States as well. 
And uh, this just shows you the progress of the 72 years in aortic surgery from placement of the endograft to a replacement of the aortic arch that we can do today very effectively. Uh, Dr. Oderich at our uh, um, institution uh, really helped to uh, lead our efforts, but it was really a, a teamwork of uh, the entire uh, division uh, that really created one of the leading aortic uh, centers with the uh, um, reconstructions of not only the infrarenal, but pararenal, suprarenal, and thoracoabdominal aorta and aortic arch. And uh, this just shows the uh, 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 different uh, uh, time points of the uh, uh, very complex uh, fenestrated branch EVAR program uh, that we established at the Mayo Clinic uh, using uh, uh, first physician modified grafts, uh, de developing uh, different protocols um, for uh, complex endovascular repair, including spinal cord protection, and then using uh, prospective studies with IDEs of. Uh, uh, different devices, and uh, now we have over 700 implants. Unfortunately, Dr. Oderich moved to uh, uh, Houston to continue his work uh, very lately, but uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, collaboration with him uh, continues, uh, and uh, his uh, excellent results will uh, hold up in uh, uh, Rochester as well, because he certainly uh, created a school that includes uh, not only uh, uh, Dr. Rana and uh, uh, Dr. Mununga, but many of our uh, recent fellows and staff as well. It really shows the outstanding results that we currently can achieve with the uh, thoracoabdominal reconstruction with 98% uh, uh, aortic uh, uh, related uh, uh, survival. Uh, some of the uh, innovations that have been uh, uh, interesting and uh, actually was, uh, were very helpful is uh, uh, the direction of try to uh, predict uh, failures of uh, uh, stand grafts in complex uh, reconstruction. This is just uh, a collaboration with uh, uh, his current team and with the uh, uh, Stanford University on computational flow modeling to assess hemodynamic changes following BVAR. And uh, uh, here with the um, uh, software, a complicated software technology, we can actually uh, do 3D reconstructions uh, before and after uh, thoracoabdominal endovascular uh, repair. And then uh, 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 predict flow changes and shear stress in the uh, uh, fenestrated uh, and uh, uh, branched endografts. And uh, with the idea that if you have increased shear stress, decreased flow rate in these grafts, then you can predict failure. And uh, the, uh, the technology is amazing uh, where you can, without even in, in um, patients who have increased shear stress without uh, visible stenosis, you may be able to uh, 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 predict uh, uh, failure of the grafts that you can uh, intervene uh, on time. Um, that this certainly is uh, one uh, technology that um, is going to gain um, uh, more wider use. Uh, this group in Stanford is extremely um, uh, interested in computational flow modeling to detect hemodynamic changes, and it is based on computer-estimated metrics using artificial intelligence to predict failing stents before symptoms can develop. The other one that we have used now for several years at Mayo, not only for uh, uh, for uh, simulation training of our fellows, but also to uh, uh, use this technology to perform the operation the day before 
we do complex reconstruction. And this is just, uh, uh, for instance, one uh, aortic model where we do uh, 3D printing and uh, we uh, 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 use uh, this patient-specific model to uh, do the uh, endovascular repair the day before the uh, uh, actual intervention. Uh, this was, for instance, a 79-year-old male with a 9-centimeter pararenal aneurysm. We practiced the uh, uh, placement uh, of the uh, 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 TEMBI endograft. Uh, and then uh, you can see on the left side the simulation model, and then next day you can see the reality, and you can see it in the uh, uh, simulation angiogram that you can actually uh, simulate almost exactly the same scenario what you are going to uh, uh, do uh, see uh, next day in the uh, operating room. And uh, this, uh, this is, for instance, uh, the happy team after we placed the very first uh, Tambi graft uh, uh, in the United States. This was another patient, 48 year old man, with a pseudo aneurysm of the uh, ascending aorta de that developed above an ascending uh, aortic graft. And what we did, we practiced uh, uh, this case uh, so that uh, we can place the endograft without occluding the coronary and without occluding the uh, uh, innominate artery. So uh, uh, this shows the uh, pulsatile model. We use uh, uh, a pulsatile model to simulate. Then we uh, place the endograft. We simulate the uh, uh, rapid ventricular spacing where we stop the heart and uh, uh, we deploy the graft. This is a little bit more uh, complex model. Again, the very same operation, and uh, we could uh, actually use that and compare it to the intraoperative uh, placement of the uh, stand graft on the right. You will see uh, the actual operation, placement of the graft during rapid ventricular placing, spacing, and the uh, uh, completion uh, angiogram. This clearly has, a, and this, this shows the patient, we, this shows again the happy team together with Dr. Pochettino also from uh, UPenn. So that group is really good uh, there where Dr. McCarthy uh, was working. We published actually this case. This was the first uh, United States Zenith ascending stand graft. Uh, our societies have been very good to uh, um, uh, reward uh, those who uh, contributed to major progress uh, in, in our field. Uh, uh, Dr. Volodos got honorary membership in the European Society, and uh, you see the uh, recipients of the SVS Medal of Innovation of the Society for Vascular Surgery. Practically five of them contributed to uh, aortic uh, endovascular surgery, Dr. Parodi, Schutter, Fogarty, Greenberg, and Dietrich, and Dr. Kistner was uh, a great innovator in uh, venous re reconstructions. Um, innovation is uh, something that you need uh, uh, a certain character and uh, uh, persistence uh, to uh, proceed and uh, be an innovator, but innovation is so important in our field. Uh, Dr. Musk was, I mean, Elon Musk was asked once, and he said that when something is important enough, you do it even if the odds are against you. Now, to get an innovation from the idea to the operating table, that is huge. And you can see the uh, life cycle of a device that takes you from the concept to, uh, to the prototype, the preclinical studies, laboratory studies, clinical studies, manufacturing, marketing, commercial use, post-market studies, until a new device come and your device uh, becomes uh, obsolete. You see, it, uh, it's time, 
lot of money, millions of money today, expertise, complex regulation, long approval, intellectual property, patents, business model, and again, funding and funding, a lot of money. So these are the major challenges that uh, these uh, innovators uh, face, skyrocketing cost, of difficulty obtained funding, uh, regulation and bureaucracy, inertia in the academic environment. You don't necessarily want to put in the energy where you don't know whether you will uh, succeed, and also the lack of uh, mentorship. And it's interesting to see, in spite of this, how much centers of innovation emerge not only some really dedicated centers like the Fogarty Institute of uh, Innovations where Dr. Fogarty said that they created an environment where medical device startups can develop technologies that lower costs and improve patient lives. But uh, institutions like our institutions realize that you need center of innovations to progress and I s can see that in more and more institutions where a, a, a clear um, dedication is to innovations that uh, can progress not only in vascular surgery but in surgery general or um, uh, in other area of medicine. So what are the solution to these challenges that we face? See grants from NIH foundations private sectors, venture capitalists, industry partners, friends, patients, patients, families, and learn the regulatory process. Uh, it's tough. Uh, Dr. Fogarty said that as innovators, we break rules and we go against standards. And uh, we who adopt the innovations, and we talked about it at the first session, that we, we have to use this innovation that we don't know well enough yet for our patients. And that is, I think, a major uh, uh, challenge. Uh, institutional review boards and uh, ethic boards are charged with protecting the rights and welfare of human subjects involved in research. And we, as a physician, you know, have to protect our patients from the innovations or the inappropriate use of innovations, and that is a challenge. Uh, many times we, who use the innovations, we have limited information on the device. We obviously need training course, we need a mentor, and we have to decide how long we need mentorship, you know. It was uh, rewarding to hear from our trauma surgeon that he needs a mentor. He knows when he has to call the mentor. If you use a, use a new device and you don't know yet, don't do it. Do it with a mentor. We did endografts, you know, with mentors for, for many weeks or months before uh, we, were, uh, allow we decided to use it alone. There is always a learning curve. There is early experience only uh, by the inventor. The patient comes and asks you what are the results and you tell the results of the inventors and not your results, you know. So that's a challenge. You have to, you have to uh, 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 be honest and, and tell the patients what your results are or are not. Uh, and the patient has to uh, um, make the decision together with you whether they go ahead for it. So, because long-term uh, uh, results are not available. The key to surgical ethics in these patients, in these cases, are, uh, is the shared decision-making. A surgeon must explain the risk and benefits of the procedure, and the surgeon's responsibility is to protect the well-being of the patients. There's a great article that uh, wrote uh, uh, in the Lancet about the ethical challenges of surgical in, in innovations uh, for patient care that stated that we need ethical surgeons and we need well-informed patients. And then we can use the innovations for the care of the patient. So uh, my take-home message to you is that surgical innovation is essential to advance cost-effective care, 
share this decision making by an ethical surgeon and a well-informed patient is the cornerstone of ethical patient care and continuous re-evaluation and improvement of new procedure performing comparative studies, cost analysis, and long-term follow-up care are our responsibilities as a treating physician. Bill Gates once said that never before in history has innovation offered promise of so much to so many in so short a time. Just give you an example, this is the operating room at St. Mary's Hospital in 1893 with William and Charles Mello, Mayo, and you can see how it looked. This is the uh, operating room now, where uh, a little bit uh, built after uh, Ali and, uh, and uh, Jesse left, uh, room eight, uh, 801 at St. Mary's Hospital. Tremendous progress in technology, and this is how the operating room uh, looks in function you know, complex endovascular aortic procedures, teamwork at the very best. Innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower, said Steve Jobs. So if you want to be, uh, uh, if you want to in innovate, you have to lead. And that's what actually we did. Uh, and that's what other institutions do to innovation, uh, became an integral part of uh, our academic uh, division. Education, clinical practice, research, and now innovation. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. And thank you again, Ali, for your uh, gracious invitation and uh, kind introduction. Thank you.